What's up, everybody? I'm Thomas J. Beleza, and welcome to The Right Mindset. Have you ever experienced second act sag when reading, writing, or dealing with a second act? Well, today we are uh, revitalizing your story's middle, mastering the second act with dynamic techniques. The second act of a narrative is the moment where you get to take your established elements from the first act and play with them by challenging their potential. This is the character, the narrative itself, plot, etc. The world which in they live. Act two can fall victim to the second act sag when things feel static. There are reasons for this, from not challenging characters enough, uh, lacking tension uh, build, and even playing it a little safe. So, in this lesson, we're going to go over ways to build on what you have introduced in Act 1, how to add tension, character development, and keep your narrative from sagging in the middle. But why is that important, Mr. Thomas? Well, I'll tell you. Mastering the second act is crucial because it forms the heart of your narrative, bridging the initial setup with the climax and eventual resolution. The second act sag can disengage readers if the middle of your story lacks direction, tension, and character development. This section is where your characters are tested, themes are explored in depth, and the stakes are elevated, making it essential for maintaining narrative momentum. Now, a well-crafted second act ensures that your story remains compelling and dynamic, keeping readers invested in the outcome. Today, we will delve into strategies to enrich this critical part of the story, which brings us to objectives. Our objective today is to understand the dynamics of the second act, to identify and implement strategies to elevate tension, uh, deepen character development, incorporate meaningful subplots, master pacing, and, uh, you know, prepare for the climax of such. I think it's important that we do a quick overview, though. Let's do this. All right. <clears throat> Act two propels the protagonist into a series of escalating conflicts and challenges, testing the resolve, character, and abilities. It's where the story deepens, introducing new allies, enemies, ooh, and obstacles, and where the protagonist's goals and desires are put to the test. Now, Act 2 concludes with the protagonist having faced and overcome significant internal and external challenges and now poised to confront the central conflict head-on in Act 3. Now, the protagonist's growth, the deepening of the story's themes, and the setup for the climax are all crucial components of a well-structured Act 2. This section of the story is pivotal for character development and plot progression and sets the stage for the resolution and final confrontation in act three as you can see act two uh has three sections in it section four is the protagonist explores the new world section five is crisis of the new world midpoint conflict and section six is finding a solution now if you haven't uh if you don't know if you don't know um there are nine plot points in Act Two. Okay, they exist for a reason. All right, <clears throat> so let's look at section four, which is the protagonist explores the world. And remember, this is going to be plot point 10 all the way to 18. Oop, I'm on the screen. Let me fix that. Boop. Okay, so the first three plot points of Act Two is known as the protagonist explores the new world. Now, what is the objective of section four? Well, it's to showcase the protagonist's adjustment to the new circumstances introduced at the end of act one, including exploration of the new world or situation and the initial challenges they face. Basically, what are the new rules, if any? You know, let's establish new characters, if any new uh situations etc etc 
All right. And within that world, we're going to introduce the protagonist and the audience to that new world that we just mentioned. We're going to allow the protagonist to take a break and have a little fun, sort of like get to know the characters a bit. Uh, doesn't mean that they're literally having fun, though they could. It just means that, uh, you know, it's it's more about who are these people in this new situation. And then finally, section four ends with the protagonist compares their current world to how things were at the beginning. And that's before we go into section five of the midpoint, uh, the crisis of the new world, the midpoint conflict, which has plot point 13, 14 and 15. Now, the objective of this section is to introduce a significant turning point that redefines the protagonist's journey, often flipping the story in a new direction or revealing a deeper level of conflict. This creates the reversal, or I should say plot point 14 will end up creating the reversal. And that is also known as the truth of the lie is revealed. So whatever they believed was true, uh, evidence is proven that it isn't true. However, the character themselves might, because they have a position, uh, not believe it at all, believe it somewhat, or believe it completely, and make adjustments based on that. All right, this brings us... We're going to, by the way, go over this stuff in a little bit more detail. Just give me a second. Section six, finding a solution. All right, this is plot point 16, 17, 18. All right, like we've said in the past, the protagonist reflects on the long-term impacts of the midpoint conflict. The protagonist decides to take action to resolve the problem created from the midpoint conflict. And of course, despite those setbacks, the protagonist decides they will succeed no matter what. Now, section six, the objective of this section, finding a solution, is to follow the protagonist's journey as they work to resolve the complications introduced by the midpoint conflict, facing and overcoming secondary obstacles on the path to the climax. Blue, blue, blue. Now, uh, before we go into it, let's go over some tips that could help you with your act two, and then we're actually going to uh, we're going to go through each section and talk about that individually and uh, hopefully get get pretty excited about that. I don't know about you. I don't know about you, but I'm excited. I'm excited. All right. Let's do it. Tip number one, intensify the conflict and raise the stakes. Act two is all raising the stakes. Go bigger, better, harder. All right. Two things you need to know is you want to escalate tension and you want to raise the stakes. So escalating tension in Act 2 is where the story conflicts should start to intensify. Each challenge the protagonist faces should be more difficult than the last, pushing them out of their comfort zone and forcing them to grow. Think about each obstacle and how it can build upon the last to escalate the overall tension of the story. Now, you also want to raise the stakes and you want to make sure that the consequences of failure are clear and significant. The higher the stakes, the more invested readers will be in the protagonist's journey. Consider both external stakes, what the protagonist stands to lose in the world around them, and internal stakes, how failure would affect the protagonist emotionally or psychologically. <clears throat> So real quick, layman's version, push them to their limits, all right? Act one is where you set and establish what they are capable of. Act two, let's see what they really are capable of. Let's challenge those capabilities, their, uh, their, their capacity for love or capacity for strength or capacity for their fears or capacity, whatever it is. If a character says they are afraid of something, let's challenge how much they are afraid of that. If they say they are, are, are loyal, let's challenge how loyal they are. If um, we show that they are the best FBI agent, let's push them to the limits of what would make them indeed the best FBI agent. And you want to raise the stakes saying that, you know, like in Act 1, let's say they're FBI agent. In Act 1, it's like they solve a case. There's really not a lot of tension. Maybe there's like, will they, won't they? They're trying to break, uh, you know, the the person they arrested and they get them at the table. And you're like, oh, this, this person's really good at their job. Well, act two, 
Maybe they can't find the person to arrest. Maybe the person keeps eluding them. Maybe they finally do arrest them, which is the midpoint conflict. And in the midpoint conflict, they can't break them. That person's cool as a cucumber. All right. You're showing them not able to do what it is they establish that they can do because they're they're being pushed to their limits. All right. Tip number two, you want to uh, show character growth and you want to show contrast between the characters and the character themselves. And what this basically means is develop your characters through trials. OK. Um, it's so important to see character development through actual push the ebb and flow you know push and pull push and pull right so use to show character growth you want to use the trials and challenges of act two to showcase character development how your characters respond to the adversity should reveal new facets of their personalities test their limits and force them to evolve ensure that their growth is consistent with the story's themes and their established traits Remember, all characters have positions on all things that they care about or even don't care about. Every character, everybody you know in life has an opinion. An opinion is basically a position, right? What they care about with political points, what they care about about emotional points, how they view relationships, what they define a relationship as. Every element of that is a position. So if you create that position in Act 1, challenge that position, and then do they completely change slightly change or not change at all and those all right are the character growth and change but you have to have logic to it you can't if it's something they are strong about completely changing would take a lot slightly changing might take half that and not changing at all means it wasn't a strong enough argument for them to change their position so that's where you want to ensure that their growth is consistent with the themes and also their established traits. Now, the contrast characters use new characters introduced in this act to highlight aspects of your protagonist and to challenge them in different ways. Allies can help reveal the protagonist's values and beliefs, while new adversaries can expose their weaknesses and fears, providing opportunities for growth. You know, this is why you run into those uh, those characters. You know, you have the funny character, you have the stoic character, you have the uh, smart character, you have this character, because their personality, just on the surface level, like let's just say that's all they are. Those characters can create position debates. A stoic character might not have much to say, but is listening to everybody, and then they say one thing, and everyone listens because when they talk, it's important. They don't always talk. They pay attention, they formulate a thought, and they say something, so now it has weight. Whereas the person who's funny is just making light of the situation. But they might also have a position. like They're like, well, I don't want to die, so like, why are we going to fight Mordor? You know what I'm saying? So having those different uh, perspectives are important. Also, the adversaries. You know, your antagonistic forces might have a good point. You, you know, the character... Challenging your protagonist on the va the value or um, the stance that the antagonist has, where they're like, "I know that I I know what you're doing is wrong, but I can almost sympathize and I have empathy for why you're doing it." Which is the Magneto position, you know. Some of us we're like, you know, I get where Magneto's coming from. <laughs> why why is he the bad guy again? Right. Anyway. All right. Number three, manage pacing and maintaining engagement. Now, two things you have to keep in mind to do that is balance action with reflection and maintain narrative momentum within your prose. All right. So balance action with reflection. While act two should be filled with action and conflict, it's also important to introduce moments of reflection where the protagonists and other key characters consider their choices consequences and the way forward these quieter moments can provide valuable insight into character motivations and help maintain the story's emotional resonance that's why in the plot points themselves they are there um they're established uh where like a moment for example if we look at um yeah i'll bring it on the screen if we look at plot point 17 
Uh, oh, wait, wait, I'm sorry. If we look at plot point 16, it says the protagonist reflects on the long-term impacts of the midpoint conflict, meaning they just dealt, they just, they just ha- dealt with section five, the rise to the conflict, the conflict itself, and the descending consequence of the conflict. And now they're in section six and they're like, that was crazy. I have to think about it. I have to reflect on it and it slows down the action because the, the, yeah, the midpoint conflict should be intense, but now it's like, let's take a breather. Right. And that's important. That's why in the, the outline, the 27 plot point outline, it dictates moments of reflection. So you can say to yourself, Oh yeah, I need to, I need to, I need to breathe. I need to let characters catch up to themselves. I need to let the reader catch up to the characters. All right. Uh, This also brings us to maintaining momentum because to ensure that each scene in Act 2 serves a purpose, whether it's advancing the plot, deepening character relationships, or exploring the story's themes, avoid unnecessary uh, diversions that could slow down the story's pace. You know, don't just make things happen to have them happen. And you also want to use subplots and side characters to enrich the narrative, but keep the main plot line clear and progressive towards the climax basically what that means is everything that happens should have purpose to it all right i say this in the videos i say sometimes things are happening but nothing is happening and what that means is it's just something that is happening but it is not moving anything forward it's not helping with character development other than no it's a character moment why is it a character moment well i want to show that the character is xyz as soon as you think that I want to show that a character is X, Y, Z. Make that scene more. Have purpose to that scene. Because I want to show a character is X, Y, Z. I want to show that they are good. I want to show that they are loyal. I want to show that they are blank. No. Characters should be shown as X, Y, Z through the entire book. Which means don't waste scenes or even chapters on showing a character's trait. They are that thing. That's a position, a loyal character. That's their position. I have a position on loyalty and to break that loyalty or slightly adjust that loyalty will take a lot, right? So allow your characters to be what they are throughout the novel. And sometimes it gets adjusted or changes. So that means allow your scenes, okay? In act two specifically, and to help maintain pacing, allow your scenes to move through the narrative breadth of what needs to happen. Okay, and then the characters are within those moments, not the other way around. If you allow the moment to be about the character for quote unquote character development, and I want to showcase that the character uh, likes to sleep a lot. There has to be more to that scene. There has to be more depth to that scene. Maybe not so much in Act 1, but definitely in Act 2. Because Act 2 was supposed to raise the tension and everything. All right. Uh, if you like uh, what you've seen so far and you haven't done so already, please uh, subscribe and hit the bell icon. All right, let's get into it. Let's go into. Bloop. All right. Act two, the conflict. Section four. The protagonist protagonist explores the new world. Now, obviously, you could pause this and write out what you need. But as always, I'm going to read it uh, just in case anyone's just listening and we're just taking notes mentally. Here goes. Plot point 10. <clears throat> in- introduce the protagonist and the audience to the new world. This is also known as plot point 10 new world. OK, the purpose is to establish how the protagonist navigates the new environment or circumstances, highlighting new rules, challenges and characters they encounter. OK. Key elements to this is exploration, adjustment, and the initial sense of wonder or conflict as the protagonist understands the breadth of their journey. All right. Now, an example, uh, if you've been watching the last video in this series, uh, we've been doing Dan Brown's uh, The Da Vinci Code. So what is the new world for the main characters? Well, the clues led them to England, remember? So uh, this is where they seek the help of uh, their buddy. All right. Uh, <laughs> Teabing. 
uh, you know, he's a Grail historian because they found they're they're trying to figure out the truth of the Grail. So, and uh, he explains the Grail's true nature. They are, you know, hey, oh, hey. okay. All right, plot point eleven. All right, now you'll see in Dan Brown's story that they take a break and have a little fun. Okay, so <clears throat> the purpose of the protagonist can take a break and have a little fun, fun and games, uh, is to provide moments of levity, character development, and exploration of the story's thematic elements without heavy conflict, often deepening relationships and showcasing the protagonist's personality and growth. Now, this is the interesting part about this, okay? There is a purpose to this plot point. And as you can see with the Dan Brown thing, they're solving the, key, the keystone puzzle, which points to the grail being not a cup, but instead something or someone far more significant. However, what scene is this? What are they doing? Huh? They're just sitting around a house and, uh, you know, they're having a conversation and they're, they're debating philosophy and logic on the situation. That and it leads to the reality that oh, the grail might be something more than a cup, especially if you're French, you know, you already have one. We don't need one, go away, you stupid knigget. I don't know if you've ever seen uh, the Holy Grail, <laughs> anyway. Monty Python, which brings us to plot point 12. The protagonist compares their current world to how things were at the beginning, the old just the position, and the purpose of this is to reflect on the protagonist's growth and changes by comparing their current situation to their original world, highlighting the journey's impact thus far. Key mo elements to this is um uh oh yeah. Key moments to this are moments of reflection, realization, or conversations that underscore how much has changed setting the stage. Now, as you can see with the Dan Brown moment, uh, what's happening here? Well, he recalls his scholarly knowledge of the Grail, the legends, and compares them with the new revelation and the reality of their quest. He's not necessarily thinking, I was in Harvard and now I'm in England. Like, he's not doing that. He's comparing th the new knowledge that the grail might not be a thing. It might be a who. Um, and the, the depth of this information and how it can really change things and that uh, he might be questioning other elements of his life. So that's important to know, too. Which brings us to section five, act two, section five, crisis of the new world, midpoint conflicts. All right. Now, plot point 13. OK, this is the build up to the midpoint uh, conflict itself. You know, the midpoint and the midpoint itself. Right. So I also. Uh, this is basically like, hey, what's going to happen? Right. So the um, the purpose here is to escalate tension and stakes leading to a pivotal moment that dramatically shifts the protagonist's understanding or approach to the conflict. And as you can see, the key elements is because it's act two rising action, increased stakes, significant challenges that push the protagonist to their limits. OK, now remember, section four, you should be doing this, but more of like a tease, a taste, you know. Let's let's try them out. But the midpoint conflict of section five is you're going up and uh, above and beyond. Right. And by the time you get to plot point 13, this is where they're like, what's going on? You hear my cat? Meow. Uh, so Dan Brown says that their journey becomes more perilous as they uncover deeper secrets, including the possibility that Jesus Christ himself was married to Mary Magdalene, who bore his child. Why would he bore his child? Like, doesn't he have like he could turn water to wine? That's not boring. That's I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm making jokes. I'm making jokes. All right. It's a pun. It's a play on words. All right. Where are we? Oh, plot point 14. The main midpoint conflict of the story. This is the midpoint. This is where it all goes. Boom. Shalaka laka. All right. The purpose to present a major revelation, challenge, or conflict that transforms the protagonist's goals 
motivations, or understanding of the conflict, often dividing the second act into two distinctive halves. So I'm sorry, my cat. I look at this the same way that I'm explaining it, right? So when I'm looking at my story, from plot point one to plot point 14 is the first half of my story. And then plot point 15 to the end is the second half of the story. So I look at all of one, plot point one to 14 as one major part of the story where the character thinks one way and sees the world one way. And even though they're being challenged and all these other things, the plot of the story is firmly in the, in the person's head. And then once the midpoint conflict happens from plot point 15, all the way to the end of the book, either they completely understand that what they believed is not true and they take action to do it. They somewhat still believe what they believed, but there's evidence that suggests that it might not be true. And they're trying to figure out which is right, or they don't believe it at all. And they continue forward trying to prove that what was revealed isn't true but usually it is and that's why by act three they you know they believe it but going back so the key elements to this is a significant event or revelation okay uh that tests the protagonists uh, the protagonist or protagonize uh potentially altering their path allegiances or understanding of the antagonist now with dan brown what is revealed here well we learn that uh their friend their friend right t bing is revealed to be the teacher the mastermind behind the plot to uncover the grail turning their trusted ally into a formidable antagonist so the, there's a couple things happening here the truth of the lie is revealed he believed his friend was his friend all right. He believed that he was having a conversation with his friend and they were trying to discover something uh, as intellectuals. He believed the teacher was somebody he didn't know. Uh, he believed the grail was a thing and not a who. OK, so there you go. And now the truth of the lie is revealed. His friend is indeed the teacher. The grail may indeed not be a thing. It might be a who, right? So all these things are happening here. So it's a reversal. It's reversing the, the movement of the plot in the sense of, well, now everything we thought we knew is different. So now we have to, you know, there's a lot going on, which brings us to plot point 15. It's like after you get like after you get all that information, right? The character is like, wow, because it's the immediate reaction or consequence to that midpoint, which is the reversal, right? The midpoint conflict itself is not the reversal, <clears throat> but it leads to the reversal. But the midpoint conflict is the reveal. The truth of the lie is revealed. And then it leads to plot point 15, which is the reversal. And the purpose is to show the protagonist's immediate response to the midpoint events, setting the course for the second half of Act 2. Elements here is the protagonist adaptation, all right? Uh, new challenges or alliances formed. And uh, they have to recalibrate, you know? They're like, <laughs> a lot just happened. <laughs> I need to figure it out. And in this situation, Langdon, uh, Langdon and Sophia are forced to flee from uh, T-Bing. And uh, I'm probably saying that name terrible. I'm terrible. I'm, again, dyslexia. Uh, they are reassessing their understanding of the grail and whom they are trust. So basically, like, you know, the truth of the lie is revealed. And then now they're kind of like, what is it? They're contemplating on it. They're like, this is crazy. Like, what are we going to do? Oh, I'm so sorry. So we're we're in plot point. We're in section five. All right. Um, so let's go to section six. <clears throat> All right. Okay. I need some soda. Excuse me. Section six, finding a solution, the descending fall from the conflict. Number 16, now the protagonist uh, is basically like, yeah, we got to reflect on the long-term impacts of the midpoint conflict. What are the consequences to what just happened because of the conflict? And that brings us to the purpose of this plot point, which is to delve into the broader implications of the midpoint's events on the protagonist's journey and the story's direction. 
which introduces the key elements of reflection, strategic planning, and the protagonist's determination to overcome new challenges. You got to get <clears throat> organized, right? And in this situation, the revelation about Tebing forces Langdon and Sophie to rely on their own wit and the few clues they have left to solve the mystery of the Grell. Okay, which then brings us to plot point 17 which is the protagonist decides to take action to resolve the problem created by the midpoint conflict or the trials. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the purpose here is to showcase the protagonist's proactive measures to tackle the central conflict armed with new knowledge, skills, or alliances. You know, and uh, key elements uh, are uh, a series of trials or tests that the protagonist must pass, each contributing to their growth and the story's progression. As we can see with Dan Brown in 17, they decipher the final clues leading them to the chapel in Scotland. So now we get to travel again, and they believe this to be the resting place of the actual Holy Grail which is the final plot point in Act 2. <clears throat> Let's get that up there. Ooh, okay. Despite the setbacks, the protagonist decides they will succeed no matter what, and this is the dedication. The purpose is to highlight the protagonist's resolve and commitment to their goal, despite the increasing odds and personal costs. Key elements uh, you should really focus on here is Show the moments of determination. Show the moments of determination. Show the significant sacrifices made for their greater goal and a clear focus on the approaching climax of Act 3. And as we can see with Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code, despite the risks and the powerful forces aligned against them, Langdon and Sophia commit to uncovering the truth about the Grail. See, they're like, we're going in. We're going, we're going in. All right. <clears throat> now, putting theory into practice is essential to mastering the craft of storytelling, especially, especially when it comes to navigating the complexities of the second act. And I encourage you to take a story you're currently working on or even a new idea, you know, you can, and uh, apply the techniques we discussed today. You know, start by identifying areas in your second act that feel sluggish or undeveloped. Use the strategies we've explored to inject new life into these sections. Whether it's through intensifying uh, <clears throat> intensifying conflicts, deepening character arcs, or introducing compelling subplots and plot points. I will say this before I continue on reading my notes. Um, usually with act two, it comes down to, am I challenging my characters enough? Am I challenging their positions? Am I giving them enough? Am I throwing enough at them that allows them to make choices to see their agency dictated by their positions or challenge their positions enough to dictate their change to that position and therefore giving them agency still. <clears throat> Are they adding to the plot by taking action and changing their positions? Things like that. And if characters are just kind of doing things, or even if you, if you feel they are being challenged, really look at the story. A challenge is they stand for one thing and, and something happens or is presented uh, even through dialogue or situational, and they now have to sort of make a choice that is based on their character, their morals, things like that. Um, you know, a real simple example uh, with a position is <clears throat> uh, if I, let's see, we're doing epic fantasy. If I... Uh, don't believe in violence. Let's say we have a pacifist for a character, right? But they grew up in uh, a time and, and a, a group of people where uh, 
fighting is a part of their culture, you know, like learning how to use a sword or the spear <clears throat> or um, or anything or axes, whatever. They grew up where not necessarily war is their culture, but like the, the style, the dance of fighting that it's, uh, it's incorporated in their religions and their past, their peace. You know, they, they do katas for peace and meditation, but it's through it's through this fine line between the weapons and not the weapons. And you have a protagonist that doesn't believe in violence and then <clears throat> their people are being attacked and they have to come up with the choice of how do I help this situation? Is it? Is this more important than my moral stance? Right? Should I grab a sword and start fighting? Is there something else I can do? Is there? Uh, can I? <clears throat> can I go speak to somebody? Can I delegate? Uh, and get people fighting? Can I be the orchestra of the violence, uh, the retort, and not necessarily pick up a sword myself? Um, maybe I could go talk to the to whoever's in charge and be like, hey, let's let's uh, figure this out, like people, you know, and. <clears throat> It's through those moments where now the character has to make distinctive choices that challenges their position of nonviolence, right? Because in Act One, you you don't really you might not see that as much, you know. It, the the challenges might be like, hey, you know, come on, it's just it's just it's just sparring. We're not actually hurting each other. Just pick up a sword, learn a sword. You know, why do you have to be so passive? Like that would be the challenge. But that rise, that increased tension is that now life is on the line. Okay. Anyway. So when you're practicing this, consider creating, you know, your outline and highlight key events that allow for character development or milestones and also pivotal moments that will occur in the second out that challenge your characters. This will not only help you visualize the trajectory, tra trajectory, of your narrative, but also ensure that each scene propels the story forward, maintaining momentum, meaning like each scene has purpose beyond, I want to show the character doing X, Y, Z. I want to show the character being nice. Or I want to tell the, the reader the history of this moment. So this scene is only for the history of, you know, this, the kingdom. But remember, the goal is to transform your second act from a mere bridge between the beginning and the end of your story and turn it into a heart of your narrative, rich with character growth and thematic exploration and escalating tension. Whew. Practice these techniques regularly, experiment with different approaches and challenges for your characters, and observe how these changes enhance the overall impact of your story. After all, it is your story. All right, let's do a final thought. Final thought. Dun, 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 dun. In the journey of storytelling, the second act is more than just bridge from a beginning to the end. It's where the magic happens, where your characters are tested and themes are explored. It's where your story breathes, grows, and takes flight. Remember, a well-crafted second act is your opportunity to delve deeper, to challenge your characters and your audience and to elevate your story from good to unforgettable. So embrace the complexity, re uh, uh, revel in the creativity, and let the second act be the space where your story truly comes to life. So keep pushing those boundaries, my friends. Keep exploring the depths of your characters. And most importantly, keep writing with passion and purpose. Next video in the series will uh, break down the purpose of Act Three. I do, I do have a question before we go, though. How do you identify when a character? La, 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 la. How do you identify when a second act is not working for you? How do you identify when a second act is not working for you? What is it you look for or notice that makes you say this second act is not working? Let us know in the comments. A blue. And obviously, if you haven't already uh, and you like what you're hearing, please subscribe and hit the bell icon so you don't miss out. As always, you know, we say it every time. Keep developing the right mindset. I'll see you next time. Bye.